Church, today we're starting a brand new sermon series. It's entitled, God is and blank. We fill in the blank with that. And you know, when you hear that statement, as I was preparing these sermons and, and I started to think like God is and what is he to me? And, and there's a whole list of words that I could use to put in that blank. But what is it that comes to your mind? You know, how, how can any of us though really know what God is like until you experience him. So too often, you know, we have a view of God and it's from our often very limited perspective because you really don't have it all together and neither do I. But our perspective of God is very limited. But I want you to know it doesn't have to be that way because each and every one of us can grow in what is he's called us to. Today our sermon is God is hope for a hopeless situation. James chapter 1, verse 17, the verse you'll hear every week this month, it says this, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Church, and for that this morning, we can be thankful that God does not change. So this morning, I, I got to ask you a few questions. How many of you have ever felt all alone? I'm talking, you can be in a room this big with 250 people and, then, and you still feel like you are completely alone in all things. How many of you have felt, or maybe you're feeling right now, like nobody sees you, like nobody cares about you? And did you ever believe, church, maybe you're struggling in this area right now that your heartache will never, ever heal? Today, what we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be looking at the name of God given to him by a servant woman. Do you realize there's, God has many names, right? God does have many names. I preached that one time and somebody came up to me after church and said, that ain't true, there's only one God. That's right, there's only one God like with many names. Like for myself, I have the name that my parents gave me. My name is Mark, but to my wife, I'm her husband or whatever she's feeling like calling me that day, right? Depends on the mood. You know, to, to my sons, I, I, I'm dad. You know, to my grandkids, I'm papa. I like to call big papa. That's what I tell them to call me. But you know what, church? The thing is this, is I have many names depending on what I am to that person. And our God is the same exact way. See, the name of God tells us the way that he relates to us. The name of God, the name that we give him, tells us about his character. You know, we have, church, many names for him. I want you to think about, for those of you who had children, you know, when, when you had your children, there, there was like a rhyme and a reason to why you named your kid that name, right? When Mary and I was picking out names, I, I was that guy, I, I, like probably because of my past, but I wanted to rhyme my name, my kid's name with every word that I could possibly think of, thinking about his future in school, I was thinking about that. But then also, too, do you realize that sometimes we grow into our name, and I wanted a biblical name. You know, I want a biblical name for my kids. And so today we're going to be looking at the name that a servant girl gave to God. Genesis chapter 16, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament a lot this month. But in Genesis chapter 16, I want to give you a little bit of a background story of what's going on here before we read the verses. We're going to be looking at Sarah and Abraham. And so Sarah and Abraham, they have a servant, basically a slave from Egypt, and her name was Hagar. See, God promised Sarah and Abraham, if you know how the story goes, right? God promised Sarah and Abraham that he would bless them with children, in fact, he told him, he said, from you will come great nation. And you know what? And he also said, in all the nations will be blessed through you. So God had great big plans for these guys, right? For Sarah and Abraham. And, and that's all in Genesis chapter 12. But when you fast forward to Genesis chapter 16, it's been 10 years. And they're still waiting. They're still waiting. They haven't even had a single child yet. They've been waiting 10 long years for that church, 10 years. Imagine waiting for something that God promised them. And they're sitting there going like, I know, I know you said it, God. Yeah. I know I heard you right. Yeah. You came to me and you said this is the way it was going to be. And it's 10 years. And we're still waiting. You know, I know for myself, if God promised me something today, tomorrow I'm going to be, is she pregnant yet? 
You know, I'll be ready. When's it going to happen? I want to know like right now when it's going to happen. But listen, it went on and on and on. And can you imagine what was going on in Sarah and Abraham's mind? Because they're sitting there going like, man, I know we heard him. Why isn't this happening yet? Did he change his mind? Is he reneging on the deal? All those kind of things. So it was 10 years of waiting and wondering what was going on. For some of you sitting here today, that's half of your life, right? Maybe some of you even, that's more than half of your life. So instead of waiting on God, what Sarah and Abraham did, they did what so many of us constantly do. They decided, you know, we're going to take matters in our own hands. You know, thinking, oh, God, we'll help you out on this one. You know, we're going to go ahead. Lord, I know you promised us, so we'll kind of do it over here. And, 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 you know, you keep your promise, but we'll take care of it over here. How many times, church, have you and I done that, that God's promises, his whole word is filled with promises for us. If we do these things that he promises us, this is what's going to go down. Instead, you know what? We want to, like, circumvent it. We're like, oh, I can't wait that long, so I'm going to go do this over here, Lord. But I still want you to bless it. And you kind of have that attitude, like, you know what, God, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you out. What's really funny, church, is we honestly at times believe and we think that God needs our help. He don't need your help. (laughs) The Bible says his plans are good, pleasing, and perfect, that they are already laid out. He just wants you to do your piece of it, that you don't have to help him out. It's already ordained for the way it's supposed to be. You just follow what it is that God said. And so you know what? Abraham and Sarah, they got practical is why we will put it. Very practical. Sarah thought, you know what? She goes to Abraham, you know what? I think this is where she got in trouble. She said, I think you need to take Hagar as your wife. She can kind of be the surrogate mother and, and start bearing these children for us. And, you know, and back in those times, church, that, that was a common practice in this culture that they could have many wives, right? It's not crazy, unusual like it would be today. But think about this. The pain and the shame that Sarah would have felt not being able to conceive because in biblical times, if a woman could not produce male children for their husband, it was brutal for them. I mean, it was awful, and even so much more pressure on her because God said, hey, you guys are going to be the parents of a nation, that I'm going to produce a nation from you too. So she's thinking, i got to be having lots of kids, right? And she don't even have one yet. So they went ahead with this plan, their plan, not God's plan, with their plan. And see, the, the plan worked. Abraham, he, he got Hagar pregnant. Really quick, too. And see, then Sarah turned. She started looking at things differently. And, and don't we do that, church? So, so the pain, the shame, the hurt that she had, it didn't go away. There was a baby that was going to be born now, and, and, and this stuff didn't go away from her. And if anything, it probably magnified. It must have increased because think about it. She's going like, man, I was the one that's supposed to have these babies, and, where, and now all of a sudden she had one like that fast? You know what? Sarah decided one day she took out her pain on Hagar. Scripture doesn't say exactly what she did. doesn't say if she, you know, clubbed her one in the head or anything like that. It doesn't tell us what happened. But we do know that Hagar was harshly mistreated by Sarah in such a way that Hagar said, I'm out. She took off. She ran into the wilderness, afraid and not knowing what to do. Now, let's check out the story. Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 7. It says this, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said this. She said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. She answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. And you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. So she's taken off in the wilderness, and all of a sudden the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, Hey, listen, it's going to be okay. You need to go back to where you're called to. 
You need to be back there. But check out verse 13. Verse 12, I'm sorry. She's talking about Ishmael. She's, the angel says this about Ishmael. He said, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Man, can you imagine being a parent and all of a sudden the angel of the Lord comes to you and says, you know that baby you got right there? Whoo, gonna be a donkey of a man. He's gonna be just bucking everyone and fighting everybody and nobody's gonna like him. He ain't gonna like nobody else. You'll be like, Lord, can we uh, renege this deal? Can we like renegotiate? Can I have door number two, right? In Hebrew, though, if you look at verse 13, Genesis chapter 16, verse 13, Hagar, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Church, in Hebrew, this word is called El Roy. It means the God who sees. See, church, he is the God who sees. He sees everything. He is all-knowing. He is all-present. He sees everything. And you know what, church? We think that we can hide things from God. You know, we're so naive, right? Because we hide things from people around us, right? You know, sometimes spouses, you don't want to tell your, your wife something that's going on because you, you don't want to get in that argument. You know, at my house, sometimes I don't want Mary to know how many Reese's peanut butter eggs that I ate in one day. So I like hide the wrappers. You know what I'm talking about? I don't sit them on top of the trash can because I call my wife Sherlock Holmes. Literally, she'll come and lift it up. What's this? It's a Reese's peanut butter cup wrapper. Can't you read? You're a teacher, right? Sherlock Holmes, that's what I always tell her. She, she wants to get to the bottom of the case, so I hide them wrappers because I don't want her to know. She ain't going to find out where I'm hiding those wrappers. But you know what? You can't do that to God. He is the God who sees. And see, this can cause some emotions in us when you come to realize who he is. It can stir up some emotions, right? I, I remember that, that when I came to that knowledge of my heavenly father, of God, realizing he knows everything about me. He knows my thoughts. He knows my heart. He knows everything I did. And it stirred up all these emotions in me. It really did. Uncertain emotions. Knowing that he sees everything. So today, what I want to do is I want to give you three of those emotions. The very first emotion that gets stirred up when you realize that God knows all, that he sees all, is con- concern. It stirs up that emotion of concern. Knowing that God knows everything about me. It's concerning because I'm afraid of him seeing everything, right? I'm afraid of him seeing at times how I live my life. I'm afraid of him seeing my sin. I'm afraid of God knowing my thoughts. Because they're not always good, but church, God sees and he knows. But you know what? We can be thankful. If you're looking at it with the right perspective, you can be thankful that there is concern. Because this is wisdom. It's wisdom. Knowing that God sees it all, that he knows it all, can keep us from doing some stupid stuff. You know what, church, in Hebrews, if you'll look at this with me, Hebrews chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says this, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give accounts. Do you realize that everything in your life that you have to give account to God? Man, I remember going to the principal's office and he said, what'd you do? I didn't want to tell him that one thing. Can you imagine having to give a full account of your life, the things that you did, the things that you thought, the things that you said, that you're going to stand before God and give him full account of your life? The Bible says all things will be laid bare. It means they will all be exposed to him because he knows it. But church, see, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, we really and truly need to know this. We need to know this because it is revealed to us in God's word. It means he wants you to know it. It means it's helpful. It means it's useful. It means, listen, now that you know, you got to watch what you're doing. It makes us think. Maybe it makes you consider the things that, that we do. 
Maybe, church, you, you, you feel an emotion of bewilderment, this wild thing, that knowing that God sees everything. You know, and if God, if you see everything, man, I can't tell you how many times I've thought of this. God, if you see everything, I don't get it. I don't get it, God, because why is there suffering? Lord, you know how many times I prayed for someone and they've been just stricken with some horrible disease and we prayed and the church as a whole will pray and we'll pray and we'll pray. I'm like, God, why are you letting this happen? You know what's going on. So why are you letting it happen? Why is all this suffering? Why is there all this sickness? Man, why is all this pain going on in, in people's lives? And this leads to another emotion. Second emotion is this confusion. We get confused. Well, God, your word says that you're a good God. You're a good, good father, right? You're like the best daddy that ever was. So why, why is all this going on? We get confused, don't we? We don't understand, especially when it's personal, when you're praying and you're asking God, like, you know, God, why aren't you taking care of this? I need you to, to fix this. I need you to heal this or, or take care of this, right? And, and we have this confusion going on. Like, God, you, you say that, that you're a good father, so why wouldn't you take care of this for me? Church, what we need to understand is we only get a partial view. Yes. When you're living on this earth, you only get a partial view. You don't see the big picture like he does. And man, it makes it hard to understand, doesn't it? See, we have blurred vision, don't we? It's kind of blurry. Biblically, right, the word of God gives us some, some foundational knowledge. We, we've got a foundation. All right, I'm a believer in Christ. I understand this is the foundation of it right here. And for some of us, right, maybe you don't understand because it's a lack of biblical knowledge. You're confused. You don't fully understand anything. Church, I want you to get this this morning. If you don't get anything out of this sermon, I want you to get this. We live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world, and sin has brought pain and suffering into our lives. That's what sin has done. It's brought pain and suffering. And we live under the curse of sin. It's the curse of sin, and there is pain with that. Just you realize that sin is destructive? When you sin, seriously, it is destructive. I can't tell you how many times someone will come to my office and it, it breaks my heart. I'll, I'll hear them, they're pouring out there, they're crying and sobbing and, 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 you know, using up all my tissues because they've got all these issues going on in their life. And you can always narrow it down. I mean, it's like a funnel. It's the sin. It's the moment that the enemy tempted you, you reached out, you took that temptation and you fell into it, and then it became sin, and that is that downward spiral. And that is where all that pain comes from. It's where all that suffering comes from. We live in a broken world, and there's brokenness and suffering because of the sin in this world. And see, we also have a spiritual enemy, church. We have a spiritual enemy that is running loose, and he's after you. He really is. He is 100% after you. And man, you want to see how hard he will come after you? When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, he ramps it up because he lost you. He lost you. And he wants you back. And the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? But yet the Bible tells us that God is good. That God is good. Because you know what, church? He has a plan. God always has a plan. There's nothing going on in your life that shocks him. There's nothing that's going on in your life that surprises him. Like, oh, that one caught me off guard. Nothing at all. He has a plan, and his plan is for redemption. Church, we, we serve a God who loves, loves to restore. We serve a God that loves to redeem. We serve, serve a God who loves to rescue us. Yes. Loves to rescue. So we have a knowledge of the Bible to help us. And you know what? You might sit there today and you're like, I'm pretty smart. You know, some of you, you can say that. I'm pretty smart. You know, I, I'm smart, but you know what? You, you can know the Bible frontwards and backwards. You really can. I mean, I, I have a couple of friends. They can rattle off scripture like you wouldn't believe. But see, there are still things that you don't understand because you have a partial view. You don't understand it. Be, you know, beware, church, of the one who tells you they understand it all. You be very careful of that person. 
See, there are things that we will never understand this side of heaven. We will never get it. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9, it, it tells us this, right? It says this, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's telling you right there, like, I think way bigger than you. You don't even understand anything at all when it's compared to what I know. See, church, we have a partial view. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, he put it this way to us. He said, we only know in part and we only see in part. That's what Paul said. You know, when your eyes are going bad as you get older, and it happens, right? And a lot of us were too vain, too proud to admit it, whatever you want to call it. Too lazy, too cheap. You don't want to go to the eye doctor. (laughs) But you know what? Your eyes keep getting worse, and suddenly when you break down, you go to the doctor, you get them contacts or glasses, you put them on, you're like, whoa. I didn't realize how bad my vision was. I didn't realize that I wasn't seeing thing at all the, the right way. And see, God, what he can do, he can open your eyes so that you can see and you can understand some things, not all things. And in heaven, church, you will understand some things. You kind of get it. But right now, church, we don't know what we don't know. That's the way it works out. We can only see parts, and we might get confused because of the fear and because of the pain in our lives. Because fear and pain, you know what it does, church? It causes us to forget God's goodness. Man, when you are in pain, you forget how God is good to you. When you're living in fear, when when you're scared to death of of what's going to happen next, man, you forget about God's goodness. You forget about what he did last month. You forget about what he did last year in your life. You kind of have that tunnel vision, right? It happens to us all. Hagar, she did the same exact thing, church. So Hagar, she had this revelation from God, right? Saying, hey, here's the way it's going to be. I'm going to bless you. Now you get back there. I'll strengthen you to get through this mess. Then five chapters later, five chapters later in Genesis, right? The promised one, the one that God promised, Sarah and Abraham, Isaac, right? He's on the scene as an infant. And then suddenly, you know what? He didn't need milk anymore. Lack of a better way to put it, they broke him from the bottle, okay? And so Abraham says, we are throwing one big party. My boy's growing up. He threw this big party, and so they're all enjoying and celebrating that, that, that Isaac, right, that he, he is no longer needing that milk. And Hagar, out of jealousy, right, here goes the ladies again, no offense, women. That jealousy starts stirring up again, and Hagar, she's ticked off. Isaac's getting all the attention. Here's Ishmael, going to be a donkey of a boy, right? He's going to be fighting everybody. And she got jealous, and she mocked. Isaac and Sarah heard her. Ticked off Sarah. So Sarah goes back to Abram, get rid of her, get her out. Get her out of here, send her packing. So what did Abraham do? Abraham gave him some provisions and he sent him away. But here's the wild part, church. God told Abraham, he said this, it'll be all right, you send them off, I'll take care of them. God supplied right there. So, so Hagar, she takes off into the desert and she uses up all her provisions, her food and her water. And, and then she and Ishmael, they're out in the desert crying their eyes out, right? Because they think it's over. And Hagar, she couldn't take it anymore. Seeing her baby boy suffering, crying, wanting something to eat. She lays him down on her bush and she walks away. She said, I can't bear to watch this anymore. She goes over here, sits down in another bush, starts bawling her eyes out. Because you know what? She's thinking she's going to die in the desert. See, Hagar had forgotten about the God who sees. The God who sees her. The God that takes care of her. And then a voice from heaven comes down and says to her, an angel of the Lord says this, it's going to be all right. He said, it's going to be okay. And then he opens her eyes. And here's the wild part, church. She sees a well that was there all the time. He says, go get a drink. He opened her eyes. That well was there all the time, but she couldn't see it because of her fear, because of her pain. 
She was separated. Tony Evans, I don't know if you ever heard Tony Evans preach. I love to listen to that guy preach. He's on Word FM. And here's what he says about the situation with Hagar. I'm going to quote him. I really like this. He said, the well that Hagar saw, it was there all the time. But she was too busy crying. She was too busy forgetting about God. She stopped trusting and she stopped looking for God. That is why she couldn't see the well. She was the one. She saw him. She knew God saw her. But she forgot, church. She forgot who he was. She forgot the name that she gave him, El Roy, the God who sees. And she's laying in the desert, bawling her eyes out, thinking God forgot her. Forgetting God's promises to her. Church, how often do we forget to look to the God who sees? How often do we forget, church, in our struggles, in our pain, in our fear, the promises that God has made for you and the promises that God has made for me? When he says, I'm going to take care of it. But boy, you want to know how, don't you? You nosy. <laughs> you know, when the world's falling apart in my home, and you know, someone's running around, I have those moments too. I'm not the strongest one always. But, you know, things are falling apart. Everyone's running around like the, the, the sky is falling. And, and, and I'll tell my kids, I'll tell my wife, it's going to be okay. One time one of my boys said to me, he said, you say that every single time. I'm like, tell me when I was wrong, we're still here. We still got a roof over our head. We're still eating. Everything is going to be okay because he is the God church who sees. See, our pain and our fear cause us to start forgetting and doubting God. Why? Listen to me this morning, church. Why does it make us doubt God? Here's why, church. Because we need to learn to get to know God more. To get to know him more. See, Hagar needed to know God a little bit deeper so that she wouldn't forget those things. You know, we can know God. But no matter how well we know him, church, you can always know him a little more than you do right now. And it comes from a relationship. You know, Mary and I have been married 27 years this August. If you go all the way back, yeah, she put up with me that long. If you go all the way back to where I met her when we were 12 years old and she was my girlfriend, we got a lot of years under our belt. A lot of years, but you know what? My wife, she knows my quirks, and she puts up with them. She knows, right, my imperfections, but my wife also knows my character. One time my wife told me, she said, you're the lioness preacher I ever met in my life. <laughs> I got mad at her. And here's why she said it. She said, when I call you and say when you're coming home, I would say, I'll be home in five minutes. 30 minutes later, I'm just leaving the church, Right? Someone catches me, I start talking, I figure out something I got to do, right? And, and, and so she understands my character because when I am not home, when I say I'm not home, my wife does not jump to conclusions. She doesn't say, who's he messing around with? What woman is he down there talking to? You know, I don't think I can trust him anymore because I don't know what he's doing. No, we don't have that relationship because my wife knows my character, and see, when we walk with God daily, when you do life with God, your confidence in him and his character will grow. That you will know, church, that he is going to take care of it. That he is going to see things through. Might not be the way you want it, but he's still going to see it through. When you trust in his character, when you do life with him. See, when we walk daily with God, we do life with God, your confidence in his character will grow. I mean, you will look to him more, church. You will look to him more for things. You will see him, church, in your pain. You will see him in your fears. You will see him to be the good, good father that he tells you is that he is a really good daddy. That he will be your shepherd. And church, you have confidence. You have confidence in your God. So we covered those emotions, right? We covered the emotions of being confused and being concerned. And the third emotion I want to give you this morning is this, comfort. Our God will comfort you. See, Hagar felt the comfort of God. In the presence of God, church, there's peace. 
there is peace. See, there is a fullness, church, of joy. Imagine the transformation that happened in Hagar when she came to realize. When she opened her eyes, saw the well was right there. And remembered that he is the God that sees her. He is the one who sees her, who knows her. He saw her, church. He knew her name. She realized that God isn't distant at all. He's right here beside me. She realized that he is an unknowable, that he is a personal God, and that he is caring, church, that he is attentive. And he and she named him El Roy, the God who sees. Do you realize today, church, that God really truly is not far away? He's not far away from you. Church, he's not asleep. He knows you. He he is intimately, church, intimately involved in your life. He even knows what you've been through. He cares. He doesn't miss a thing. He is a God who sees. So church, God gave Hagar great comfort. He not only gave her comfort, he gave her a future hope. He said, you get back there. I'll strengthen you. I'll take care of you. I know it's going to be tough. I know that's a messy situation that you're going back to, but you go back to your master and you live the life that I've called you to. So she had a future hope, church. She could go back in that difficult situation and she could endure it. She knew that God was with her and he cared for her. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Man, you guys have heard this verse so many times. He said this, he said, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Church, do you realize how valuable you are to your heavenly Father? God sees you. He sees your worries. He sees your fears. He sees your insecurities. And not only that, church, he is seeking you out this morning. He's seeking you out. God wants to replace your pain with peace. The peace that passes all understanding. God knows you, church. He already knows you. But he wants to be known by you. He wants to be known by you. That you know his character, you know who he is, and he wants you to seek him, church. He wants you to seek him. And when you seek him with all your heart, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah that he will be found. It's a declaration, he says. You will find him. And when you find him, church, you will begin to see his love, you will see his mercy. You will see peace. You will see a holiness that will transform you. You will see hope. Church, you will see a way maker. You will see joy. And more than anything, here's what you're going to see. You will see freedom. He will set you free. So this morning as I ask the praise team to come up here today, I want to share one last verse with you, and it comes from Psalm 121, verses 1 through 2, and it says this, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Church, I want to remind you this morning, he is the God who sees. He sees exactly where you're at right now. Maybe you're sitting here in church and you're struggling. I mean, you're struggling big time. You're you're coming to church today and and you don't even know which end is up because your life is, is just upside down. You're struggling so much. I don't know what you've got going on. But I want to encourage you not to be like Hagar in the middle of the desert where you just give all hope up. So much so that you 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 cast the most important things away from you and say, I give up. It's not worth it anymore. And I hope for you this morning that you will recognize and that you will see the God who sees you, the God who cares about you, the God who understands you. Listen, he understands everything about you. He made you. He put you together. Because church, once you get all that, 
then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It will set you free. So this morning, what I want to encourage you to do, I want to encourage you to lift your eyes to your helper and to your hope this morning. I want you, for those who came into church today, believing that there is no hope in your hopeless situation, that you will recognize that there is a God, and a God that sees you, and a God that recognizes you, and a God who wants to be there for you, but He wants you to come and know Him in a mighty way. And for those of you who are sitting here today, and you are living your life outside of Christ, here's what I want to tell you, church. You are robbing yourself. You're robbing yourself. Because God designed you to have a right relationship with Him. He wants to transform you into the man or the woman that He created you to be. But here's what holds us back, our sin, our shame, the things that we've done, things of our past. Maybe it's even the things that you're in right now, in the present. Here's what I want to tell you this morning, church. God can make all things right. I don't care what it is. Maybe some of you, you're sitting here today, you're believing the lies of the enemy where he's saying, that's for everybody but you. There's no hope for you. Do you remember what you did? Do you understand what it is that you did in that life that God told you not to? He'll never forgive you. That is a lie. Remember, church, Satan, the enemy, he is the father of all lies. Everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. There is a hope for you and it comes through Jesus Christ. So this morning, If you've never accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, I really want to encourage you, come out of the desert. Stop being hungry. Stop being thirsty. Stop being that person that is living with no hope. And it's this simple, church. We make it too hard. All you have to do is confess your sins to him. Admit it. He already knows them. You ain't telling those secrets. He wants you to confess them to him. Repent of them. And he wants you to accept his son Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And don't go back to that old life. Stop going back, church. Stop wanting to touch that old thing that keeps hurting you. Walk forward into the newness that he gives you and to follow him in Christian baptism. And so, church, that is for you today. If that is someone, if God is speaking to your heart about that day, I want you to come forward. We can have someone pray with you this morning so you can receive Christ. And for the rest of you people who are here today, you believers in Christ, how many of you right now are living like Hagar did in the desert? You've forgotten what God has done in your life. You've forgotten. And you're sitting there thinking it's hopeless. And there is a well right there in front of you. God wants to reopen your eyes today, church, so that you can see what it is that he is doing. So how about it? Let's stand together and let's sing. But I want to encourage you, church, to respond this morning.